Welcome, dear Trinity friends, as we prepare for worship via this video time together. Just a reminder that for those who feel comfortable doing so, we will continue our outdoor worship at the Trinity Get Gathering area. This will happen, weather permitting, at 9 o'clock tomorrow, Sunday, this being Saturday when we're doing the videoing. It will be a time of thanksgiving for the Trinity Trails and Gathering area, which has ser served us so well over the last few months. We will also have a mission focus and we'll enjoy uh, our annual church picnic. So bring your own items to eat and as well as the necessary utensils and there will be a fire for roasting. On an additional note, Ruth Ann Olson, Tony Morley, Martine Redshaw and I were able to participate in a Zoom slash phone conversation with Principal Louis Nusson from the Bonne Nouvelle school and church in Bigone, Haiti. Folks from other partnering, partnering organizations also participated and we'll provide the particulars of that conversation in an upcoming newsletter. But there's a remembrance of our ongoing relationship. Uh, you'll find that uh, gift of music at the end of today's worship video. It was recorded during our Haitian friends visit with us uh, back in March of 2018. There is also an accompanying photo of the newly completed Bonne Nouvelle Church, which replaces the one that was destroyed by the 2010 earthquake. So please remember our Haitian neighbors as they journey on their life in Christ. As Trinity looks forward in mission, we pursue connections which allow us to share the good news of Jesus, both near and far. Sharing takes on many forms. We renew our commitment to our local community. We affirm our partnership with Bonne Nouvelle Church and School in Haiti. And we welcome new relationships. For this video and during our in-person Sunday worship tomorrow, we welcome Hovland neighbors Andy and Amy Schmidt as they share their desire to minister through agriculture in Tanzania. Trinity Council has committed our congregation to upholding the Schmidt family in prayer as they participate and prepare for this ministry. Dear friends, please tell us a little about the life-changing developments in your family's life as you look forward to ministry in Tanzania. Welcome. Thanks, Kristen, for that introduction. Um, so we are, this is my husband Andy and I'm Amy, as Kristen said, and we have been called as a family to serve on the southern coast of Tanzania in a mission that is focused on agriculture and sharing the gospel. So just a little tiny background for you. Um, the southern coast of Tanzania is almost entirely Muslim and unreached for the gospel. They are also, by and large, subsistence farmers who are living essentially hand to mouth. Um, centuries of a slash and burn agriculture technique have left their farmland depleted of nutrients um, and have made it very difficult for the farm families to be growing enough food to even feed their families, let, en let alone enough to make um, an income to get by on. So, about 10 years ago, a missionary family who had been there, they've been in Tanzania for over 30 years, they started a training farm on the southern coast of Tanzania with the purpose of trying to abolish some of this food poverty that is happening by teaching sustainable agriculture techniques, at the same time sharing the gospel. A part of what they are doing as well is an intern program where Tanzanian believers from interior Tanzania who are planning to be sent by their churches to these remote villages to share the gospel come to the farm. Kilimo Timilafu is the name of the farm. That means holistic farming in Swahili. They are sent to the farm for a year-long internship where they learn these farming techniques and they are also discipled um, in the best ways to reach their Muslim cousins for the gospel. And then after a year, they're sent out to these remote villages where they can take these sustainable agriculture techniques and the gospel to these remote villages. So the farm kind of functions as um, the hub of a wheel to take these farming practices and the gospel along the coast of Tanzania. 
And Andy specifically has been asked to manage the vegetable farm portion of this farm. So he'll tell you a little bit more about that now and what he is excited about. Yeah, so I'm excited to use uh, my experiences that I've had vegetable farming um, to work in an area whose food needs are so pronounced and on such a daily, um, day-to-day -day, um, level. I, I, um, one of the issues that they face is that they have all of their rain falls within about four months of the year and then the rest of the year is completely dry. So one of the things that I'm excited to be working on is a an irrigation, a drip gravity fed drip irrigation system that will allow the cultivation and of vegetables throughout the the dry part of the year. Um, another thing I'm really excited about is just working alongside Tanzanian farmers and tribesmen, uh, forming relationships with them, learning with them, and getting to to call them my friends. Yeah, um, myself personally, I'm excited really to be doing what I'm doing here in Hovland, which is just being a friend and a neighbor to the people around me. I'm excited to live in an African village. I'm excited to um, expose my children to a new culture. I'm excited to expose myself to a new culture. And to be in community and relationship with the other mothers um, in the village, learning from them, learning a different way of doing life, um, a different way of understanding the world. Um, I'm very excited to attempt to learn a language and to learn some of the skills that they have. I want to learn how to weave grass mats. I want to learn how to cook like they do. Um, I'm really am just excited to be with the people um, of that village, the Minchinga people on the coast of Tanzania. Um, our kids are the most excited about swimming in the ocean because this particular <laughs> village is on literally on the coast, so the, the Indian Ocean is right there, um, and to climb trees, specifically the baobab tree, which is a really incredible, incredible tree. And there's a very big baobab tree in the backyard of um, where we will be living, so they're very excited about that. Um, Andy will share a couple of concerns or just you know things that we are anxious about or asking prayer for right now. Yeah, I think learning the language as a family is going to be uh, an obstacle. That's something that I think will be will be hard, but uh, necessary to form relationships. I, I'm also a little intimidated of the heat. Uh, we're clearly not not used to the to the weather of sub-Saharan Africa. I think that'll be another another hard part. I think the one of the more intimidating things for me to navigate will be living in a um, in a Muslim culture in which women are are often treated um, not as well as they were, as they are here, so I think having a wife and a daughter in that place will there will be uh, some challenges to to work through in that I think also in line with that, um, just the resistance to the gospel is a huge concern, um, like Andy said, this is a Muslim. Uh, part of the country, mostly entirely unreached. There is one very small church body um, of about 20 members maybe, and that's the only church within a radius of 200 miles. Um, we're very fortunate that we can be a part of that church body, um, and that is a huge praise for us that we are coming directly in to um, a situation where people have already been working. Um, to share the gospel of Christ, and to some extent it has been received, but there's a lot of resistance to that and a lot of spiritual oppression. Um, so we, we do worry about that as parents, too, because we are not um, a couple without kids. We have two young kids who are leaving a blissful life in Hovland where they were both born and raised and where they love to be. Um, so that's a huge area of concern for us, but not... Um, not so much that we're not willing to go because the gospel of Jesus is worth everything that we can give and we know um, that it is the right thing to do and we're very excited and we feel extremely privileged um, and honored to be called to do this. 
Um, so in closing, we'll just share um, that we are in the support raising phase of this process. We're hoping to leave midwinter. Um, if anyone is excited about partnering with us through prayer, through prayer or through financial support, we would love to talk with you. Um, I think that Bill shared some of our contact information um, through an email. Otherwise, we can get that to you via Kristen. Um, and we're excited to talk to people and just to share what the Lord is doing on the coast of Tanzania and how we get to be a part of that and how you can be a part of that with us. So thank you guys so much for having this time with us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this vision of walking alongside your future partners in Tanzania and be assured that we will be praying alongside of you. Thank you for being here with us. As we enter into worship, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us and guide us in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
The Gospel reading for this 17th Sunday after Pentecost is from Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, If we say from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. After reading today's text, all I can say is, my goodness, we are a contrary people. In Ezekiel, we read, the parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. And the way of the Lord is really unfair. In today's Gospel from the 21st chapter of Matthew, we heard the first son in Jesus' parable refer, reply to his father, I will not go. The second son did not go. Likewise, the priests and elders did not believe John. They did not change their minds and believe him when given the opportunity. The New World Dictionary on our shelf at home defines contrary as inclined to oppose or disagree stubbornly, disinclined to accept direction or advice. At what age does a child first respond to direction with no and I won't? One year, one and a half, two years? And forget the tantrums that they begin about the same time. We seem to have a propensity from an early age to push back on authority, to crush question authority, even if our lives depend on the person we are questioning. Even as adults, we bristle at advice from others. Lord help you if you try to tell me what is good for me. We question the seeming impositions of others on our lives, especially if we do not recognize or accept their authority. For Matthew, it all rests on the question of authority. It is the question that is at the center of Matthew's narrative. The established leaders are trying to understand Jesus' ministry. In earlier chapters, the Pharisees failed to understand Jesus' purpose in eliminating the barriers that separate the obedient from the sinful and the clean from the unclean. In the passage that precedes our gospel text for today, the chief priests and elders are struggling to understand Jesus' public encounter with the money changers in the temple. Who is this young upstart who has failed to gain his authority in the traditional way? For in those times, 
Spiritual authority was passed from leaders to candidates by the laying on of hands, much as it is done today. Although he didn't follow protocol, yet his praises were sung by the people in the street. Little do the traditional leaders know that, like the questioning child's dependence on his, de on his parents, their very existence depends on Jesus. At the same time, Jesus is questioning the authoritative role of the priests and elders. He offers them a daring promise that he will reveal the source of his authority if they will respond bravely, ultimately admitting their own sinfulness. Instead, those responsible for the community's religious life respond with a weak answer. We don't know. However, it is their role to identify the false prophets, but by refusing to answer, they sabotage their own authority. So, maybe a little contrariness can be a positive thing. Asking questions about power, who has it, where it comes from, and how is it man maintained is important in a church that is continually in the process of reforming. Continually asking, who has the authority to speak for God? As we ask these questions, it is probably wise that we put ourselves in the place of Jesus' adversaries. Too often, we hide behind Jesus and point our fingers at others. The danger is that we reduce, then, Jesus' authority to our terms, placing him on the same level as ourselves. Perhaps it is necessary that we place ourselves, instead, in the situation of being confronted by his daring questions. Perhaps we need to struggle with those questions. In the next few months, as we consider God's mission through his church, we will look often to our mission statement, teach, live, and share Christ's love in our church, in our community, and beyond. Will we be willing to ask the refining questions? How will we understand Christ's authority and the movement of the Holy Spirit in the process? Well, we have a reference point in today's epistle lesson. The beautiful text from Philippians 2 is, the, is one that many of us have memorized because it reads like a hymn. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. As we move forward, imagining what Trinity's future can be, we put a robe of genuine humility we put on a robe of genuine humility in order to participate in the reign of God on earth. A recent Augsburg publication provides this definition of humility for Sunday school students. Although humility has been often misinterpreted to mean that people should restrain themselves, make themselves small, and hold back from using their talents in ways that are too powerful, to be humble is actually to be fully and powerfully all that God has created us to be, while also seeing ourselves as part of God's larger creation. So, how do we proceed in humility and with Christ's authority? American theologian Frederick Buechner stated the following, The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. As we consider growing in the areas of worship, Christian formation, stewardship, mission, evangelist, evangelism, and justice ministries, what gifts and talents do we bring to the table? What are the needs that we see in our church community, in our local community, and beyond our regional and national boundaries? What are the partnerships and relationships that we celebrate together now a year from now, 
five years from now. Who can forget our time together building the trusses and benches for Trinity's new addition? Folks from all walks of life came together to share their skills, learn new ones, eat meals together, meet new friends, create as a team, learn from others by sharpening tools, sizing and cutting timbers, lifting, hammering, carving, painting. We got in each other's way and we helped each other. We made tiny strides, we took larger steps. Moving the trusses and placing the benches, lifting them into place. As a result, we have a space that we can enjoy, that provides for our ministry needs, that brings joy to all who stop by, and that causes us to respond in thanks to our God. As the Holy Spirit guides us into God's future for us, yes, we will continue at times to be contrary. But how can we harness those questions regarding God's authority and our authority for good? Created in God's image, we are also capable of generosity and humility. As we move forward, we respond to the questions, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? The hymn, Son of God, Eternal Savior, with text by Somerset C. Lowry, recognizes the authority by which we live in the following verses. Son of God, eternal Savior, source of life and truth and grace, word made flesh, whose birth among us hallows all our human race. You are head who throned in glory for your own will ever plead. Fill us with your love and pity, heal our wrong and help our need. As you, Lord, have lived for others, so may we for others live. Freely have your gifts been granted, freely may your servants give. Yours the gold and yours the silver, yours the wealth of land and sea. We but stewards of your bounty, held in solemn trust, will be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And now receive the benediction from our text in Philippians. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Go in peace. <laughs>